For as long as I can remember, I've had a fascination with nature and the unexplored wilderness. I remember meandering through the woods outside my house when I was a kid, collecting plants and fungi for personal collections. I would sometimes wander through shallow ponds, catching frogs, toads and newts, armed with a small net, the same net being used for catching insects as well. As time would pass, I'd eventually move onto greater wilderness, geared with hiking, camping and photography equipment for the wildlife I sought to capture shots of. Today, I'm a biologist and environmentalist, with my wildlife expertise being mainly in mammals, specifically bears and large carnivores. The job I remember having the most was with the Canadian Wildlife Service, or CWS for short, where I was tasked with tracking and observing grizzly bears in order to assess the challenges and threats they face. You see, permanent removal of suitable habitat by human activity within grizzly distribution remains one of the principal threats to the bears. And because individual grizzlies need large home ranges, large-scale industrial projects, increased future resource development, and establishment of transportation corridors could potentially pose a significant threat by the removal of a larger portion of effective habitat, in turn significantly limiting their range. Climate change also posed the threat, with mountain pine beetle populations propagating as a result, and destroying forests of white bark pine, these trees being an essential food source for grizzlies. One day, the service put in charge of a localized project for grizzlies in a heavily remote part of the Albertan part of the Rocky Mountains. The Rockies of Alberta are known for being a vast, largely inaccessible stretch of wilderness, with many parts only reachable by air. This has made it a refuge for the plethora of wildlife, many of whose population trends in the area are still as of now unknown. The expedition would last about two weeks and would consist of tracking individual bears as well as measuring anthropogenic effects and, to a lesser extent, the effects of climate change on the area. Without further delay, I prepared my gear and left to help with the project. I had flown over from operations in Calgary to the location of the base via helicopter, where from then on out we would continue throughout the mountains on foot, setting up camp at different locations. We were expected to return to the base at the end of the expedition, where we would be airlifted back to civilization. Upon arrival at the base, the site was just a small opening on a mountainside, surrounded by nothing but what seemed like endless coniferous forest. Nestled here was a small log cabin where my colleague Sean, a veterinarian who had arrived here about a few days earlier, had set up operations. After the helicopter left, I went on over to the base cabin to check in. When I entered, Sean was there, testing out the radio tech used to track bears. He seemed very focused on the task at hand. It took him a few seconds to notice my presence. Oh, you're here perfect timing too. He seemed rather ecstatic upon seeing me. Yeah, quite the hassle getting here, I had replied. Curious about the tracking equipment, I asked. You collared one already? Sure did. Darted and fitted a large so about two days ago. I'm not entirely sure, but she might be pregnant. Hearing this, it did make sense, as around this time of year, female grizzlies would be gestating after mating in the late spring or early summer preparing to hibernate for the coming winter. You have to take me to her. I should be able to confirm a pregnancy. Well, now that you're here, we can get moving. Immediately, we readied our gear and set out with an antenna and receiver to find the sow. We hiked for several hours, following the direction the antenna led us in, as well as signs in the area which would indicate a bear passing through. Despite our efforts, however, we found little to nothing not even a sound from the receiver. As it started to get dark, we settled down in a small clearing to set up camp for the night. It seemed quite odd that despite a bear being tracked, there was little evidence, if at all, of any bear in the area. Something about this was all bizarrely off. The next morning, we awoke to the sound of the receiver producing a tone. As soon as we heard this, it had to mean the bear we were looking for was nearby. We rushed to back up and head out in the direction of the signal, 
and as we headed out, the tone from the receiver became louder. I knew the sooner our bear was in sight, we had to proceed with the utmost caution. After being darted, the bear could become incredibly agitated and charge, so I would have to take the shot from a safe distance. However, as we treaded through, we reached what seemed like a cave opening at the foot of the mountain. It was here I knew that any further advent was far too risky, as entering a den with a bear inside was straight up reckless. Sean turned to look at me and asked, Now what? I don't think she's coming out. Considering that this time of year, bears would be preparing for hibernation, that was most certainly a possibility. We will set camp out away from here, might have to abort if she doesn't leave by tomorrow. Reluctantly, we set off about half a mile north of the den and set up camp for the night. Come the following day, we woke up, packed up camp and headed back to the den site. However, when we got there, something was wrong. The receiver wasn't creating the tone anymore, not even faintly. While this might have meant that the bear had left the den, there were no tracks shown to be leaving the den. Everything was as we had left it. Another possibility was that there was a malfunction with the radio collar, and that due to an unknown cause, it had stopped transmitting signals to the receiver. We gotta go in. I was set into a state of surprise and fear from hearing Sean suggest this. I told him, Are you insane? We could get ripped to shreds entering that den. Well, I don't see any other way we're going to recover that collar. As life-threatening as this idea was, I came to the realisation that no other option was available. Okay, fine. I hesitantly agreed. But the moment I hear anything, we get out of there immediately. We entered as slowly and as cautiously as we could, neither of us making so much as a whisper. Inside, however, the den was not just a den, but seemed to be a small network of caverns. This made me even more fearful, knowing the bear could charge and maul one of us at any moment, if still inside. As we proceeded, I noticed a metallic glint. I walked over to it, to see that it was the radio collar off the bear's neck. How this happened, I honestly had no idea, with my best guess being some weird error with the collar itself. I picked it up, and when I turned around, Sean was nowhere to be seen. I wanted to call out for him, but didn't want to make any loud noise in case the bear was still inside the cavern with us. Frightened as I was, I cautiously proceeded to look for him, my heart beginning to pound. As I traversed through, I saw a faint light, the exit to the den. I rushed toward it, hoping to find Sean outside. When I exited the cave, the surroundings around me were... different. Back when we arrived, it was a heavily forested area. But what I was looking at now was more of an open mixture of forest and parkland. What the hell happened? Some of the gear we had left outside was missing as well. There wasn't even a trace of it. Oddest of all. It was night. The only explanation I could think of at the moment was that the caverns we had entered led to various openings and that I had simply gotten lost and ended up at a different exit from where we had entered at first. But there was no possible way we were in the caverns for that long. Despite trying to rationalise this, I decided that locating Sean was a more important priority. I headed back in what I believe was the direction of camp, believing he had somehow returned there, with the brightness of the night sky being the only thing allowing me to navigate my way through. Before, we had quite a bit of trouble moving through the dense woods, carrying our equipment and all. But now, the trees seemed much sparser, almost as if I was in a tundra of the Yukon. I just ploughed on through, trying to make sense of what was happening. Yet to no avail did I find any sign of our last campsite. None of this made sense. The surroundings, the time of day, I had no idea what the hell was going on. As I was trying desperately to make sense of my situation, in the distance, 
I caught a glimpse of several ominous figures moving around. I wasn't able to make out what they were at first, but when I approached to get a better look, I recognized it as a small herd of caribou. My first thoughts was that this was good news, seeing as woodland caribou are a threatened species, and the fact that this area is home to a healthy, previously unknown population could aid in the species' conservation efforts. Yet at the same time, something seemed a bit off about them. Woodland caribou are characterized by a darker tone of fur, as well as thicker and somewhat pronounced antlers. These, however, sported a silvery coat, as well as a more curved antler shape, reminiscent of the barren ground subspecies found farther north. Could these have been some sort of weird morph, or perhaps a hybrid subspecies? I ultimately decided to move on and continue searching for Sean, in spite of things continuing to make no sense. I continued wandering through the brush aimlessly, still no success of finding any sign of Sean anywhere, and at this point I was tired. As soon as I got to the nearest outcropping, I sat down to catch my breath for a brief minute. I took this time to look up at the night sky. The view was, admittedly, beautiful. While it's easy to view the stars better in places far from civilization, as I've had the privilege of from time to time before, here it was unlike anything I've seen before. I'd never seen the sky at this time in such vivid detail. I simply sat for a good ten minutes, mesmerized by the sight of it all. My attention was shifted upon hearing a faint, slow rumble. The best I could describe it was a soft drumming noise that I could just barely hear but I could somehow feel it, as if it was sending some sort of vibrations through the ground. Curiosity once more took hold of me, and I headed out towards the source of the noise. Was some sort of animal creating these sounds? The largest animals in the region are wood bison, which do make deep grunts and low rumblings, although this sounded much more... rhythmic. Wanting to find out, I continued in the direction the noise was emanating from. It started to increase in volume as I got closer, to the point where it started to sound more familiar, like I've heard this exact sound somewhere before. I finally reached the source of the noise at a lakeside, and what I saw, I still have no rational explanation of what, or more so, how I saw what I had seen. At the shore, there were several large animals elephantine in appearance, long hair and curved tusks. There was no mistake, I was laying eyes on a herd of living, breathing, woolly mammoths. How though, how was an animal supposedly extinct for 10,000 years right here in front of me? None of this could possibly be real, I had to be imagining or hallucinating, but there was no possible way that any of this was a real scenario. I took a good five minutes to get myself together before coming to terms with the fact that all of this was most certainly real, and right before my eyes. I knew the sounds were familiar, as I'd heard similar bellowing before many times from captive elephants. While I still had to take care of the situation I was in, I couldn't help but take some time to just look. I decided to sit and watch the mammoths go about their business. The structure of the herd seemed identical to modern elephants, the adults being all female, with two calves present, likely not even a year old. They appeared to be feeding on low brows, lichens and shrubs, probably why they've come to the lakeside. The ground beneath them was littered with fecal matter, the smell being quite strong even from where I was sitting. While I didn't want to get too close, I wanted to get a better look, so slowly I walked down to the shoreline. Once I was closer, my view was much better. I noticed one of the calves running around in the shallow water, splashing and rolling as well. I had no doubt that this was play behavior, reminiscent of African and Asian elephant calves. Soon after, it trotted ashore, shaking itself like a dog. My attention then turned to one of the herd's adult females, who apparently was looking right at me. To ensure my safety, I stood my ground, as it watched me for a good, solid minute. Soon after, it turned back towards the herd, 
losing interest in me. It was in this moment, right here, that my childhood sense of wonder was overtaking me. I was right here, laying eyes on animals nobody has had the chance to see for several millennia, not even questioning how, simply relishing the fact that it was happening. Then, right out of nowhere, a distant, a deep, echoing howl broke out. The sound caught the attention of the herd, who, with haste, immediately started to depart the area, bolting out into the brush without looking back. As somebody who's worked with large carnivores, I've heard the howls of wolves many times before, and have tracked several packs in my day. However, that sound was like no wolf I've ever heard. Whatever it could have been was apparently dangerous enough to scare the mammoths away. I decided not to stick around and proceeded to return to my search for Sean. I headed out into the brush once more looking for any signs. I was still very hesitant to call out, not wanting to draw the attention of whatever creature made those howls. Then something off caught my attention within a small grove of trees. As I headed over to inspect it, my eyes lit up in shock. It was the gear and supplies that Sean was carrying around with him, but all torn up as if something had grabbed it and ripped it to shreds. The antenna I used to pick up the radio signals from before was there and was totaled. On the ground next to the wreckage were large footprints, seemingly canine in appearance, but larger than any wolf track I've ever seen. That's when I heard it again. This time, the sound was much closer and was accompanied by faint snarls, hinting at more than one animal. My heart started pounding as I bolted back into the woods in the direction of the cave, not sure if Sean was even alive or not, but just concerned with getting out of here alive. As I was running, the foliage around me started to rustle. I froze up in fear, hoping whatever it was would run the other way. Then something jumped out. It was Sean all covered in bloody scars with his clothes torn up. What the hell? What happened to you? Run, just run, now. Not far behind him, I could hear faint howls and snarling. The two of us bolted out of there, not looking back, just headed for the caves as fast as we could. We finally got to the entrance of the caves. But then, that's when we saw them. Two large, dog-like animals jumped in front of us, gnashing at us with a deep, roar-like bark. This stopped us dead in our tracks, both of us frozen in utter terror. These things resembled some unholy conjoining of a wolf and a hyena. I've worked with plenty of large predators in my day, but these... I didn't know what the hell these were. The larger individuals had its sights locked on us, and with each second inched towards us closer readying itself to pounce. As it slowly backed us away, two more appeared from behind us, baring their teeth at us to drive us towards the jaws of the other two, cutting off any route of escape. Now, there was no exit, as all four of them closed in on us, preparing for the kill. Then, Sean looked at me. You've got to get out of here while you still can. Without saying anything else, he made a break for it. No way, don't. My words did nothing to stop him, and without hesitation, the creatures darted after him. Within seconds, all four were on top of him, violently ripping him to pieces. All I could hear was his muffled screams against the frenzied snarls and hisses. I knew at this point there was nothing I could do. I made a run for the cave. When I entered, I desperately scurried through the caverns, it didn't matter if there was any bear in there or not, I just wanted to leave. I could barely see a thing in the darkness, but none of that mattered. I just kept rushing on through. Finally, I saw a faint light, and without hesitation, I ran to it. When I got out, I was back. When me and Sean entered in through, the gear we'd left outside was still there, and it was daytime. It was just day as if absolutely nothing changed. What the hell had just happened? I was still shaken up by what I had just witnessed. The image of Sean getting torn up by those things was still fresh in my mind. 
Without any delay, I ran back through the woods to the base as fast as I could. It took me at least three hours before I finally got back to base. When I did, I proceeded to go and radio CWS. I had reported a state of emergency, as my colleague Sean was missing, and that I was unable to locate him. I felt that if I tried to explain everything I'd witnessed, they'd think I was delusional. The next day, a helicopter was sent to pick me up and return me to Calgary. Alberta authorities were unable to recover Sean's body, and his death was listed as a potential bear mauling. Soon after, I stepped down from my position at CWS. To this day, I can still hear the echoes of Sean's scream as whatever the hell those things were tore him to shreds. I still have not been able to make out or rationally explain what all of that was. That place I'd come across, how was it there? How was any of that even possible? My whole life, I dreamed of discovering something that has not been found. But after all I'd been through, it made me come to realize Perhaps some things are better left alone.